In this video, I show you how to take beautiful pictures of waterfalls. Adorama TV presents Take and Make Great Photography with Gavin Hoey, where you'll learn how to take stunning photos and then polish them in post-production. Here's your host, Gavin Hoey. Hello, I'm Gavin Hoey, and you're watching Adorama TV, brought to you by Adorama, the camera store that has everything for us photographers. And as you can probably see and hear, today this video is all about photographing waterfalls. Now, waterfalls, for me they're a little bit like fields of poppies or anything rusty. I've got to photograph them, they are just beautiful forces of nature. But how do you get a really good photograph of a waterfall? Well, that's what we're going to cover in this video. And there's a few things that you need, and fortunately Adorama sells everything that you need. So first of all I'm going to be using my SLR, this is my 5D Mark II, and of course I'm going to be using my standard 24 to 105 mm lens. Now that lens works really well in this case simply because of the 24 mm end of that lens. That's a really wide angle view, and normally with waterfalls that's what you want. You want a wide angle lens to get a great big sweep, a big vista in your pictures. However, in a minute I'm going to switch to the 105 and we'll do some more close-up detail shots of the waterfall. Now you're going to need a tripod because I'm going to be doing long exposures to make the water blur nice and smooth and give it that super silky look. And I'm using my Vanguard 283 CT tripod to do the job. Okay, that's the technical stuff, but there is one more optional bit of equipment that I would recommend you have handy, and it's this. Uh, this is a circular polarizing filter. This is going to stop a couple of stops of light and that means it's going to double your shutter speed or quadruple your shutter speed and that can be the difference between getting a good shot and a great shot depending on the brightness of light. Now today my waterfall is actually in shade so I may not need this, we'll see how we go. Okay let's get going and take some photographs. Now first of all when it comes to my settings I'm going to be working in shutter priority mode. So that's S on most cameras or TV on a Canon. And let's start off with 100 ISO, so a nice low ISO setting. And I'm going to put in a shutter speed. Well, let's go for a 15th of a second and see what we get. OK, so let's frame this up. And I'm going to take my shot. Now, I've got this camera set to its uh, two second self timer. And that just gives me a couple of seconds to let go of the camera, camera to stabilize, and for my picture just to be a little bit sharper. And that gives me a, a fair amount of movement in the water. Is a fifteenth of a second the right setting? I've no idea. So let's try another shutter speed and see how it changes. I'm going to go down, let's go right the way down to one second. So one second gives a completely different look. The water is beautifully soft and very, very smooth, but we've still got some detail in there. Now, because I'm in shutter priority mode, the camera is doing the work for me, and I can see that that was f22. So that stopped the aperture down as small as it will go. So if I try and dial in a longer shutter speed, let's say four seconds, the f22 is now blinking at me. It's telling me that I can't do that. So if I try and take a, a picture of that settings, it'll let me do that, but it's going to be really, really overexposed. Very, very bright. Too much light has come in. And that's where the little polarizing filter really comes in. Because this will stop two stops of light. I'm not interested in the polarizing effect today. There's no real sunlight to, to polarize here. It's, it's pretty flat lighting at the moment, perfect for waterfalls. I'm just interested that this is like a, a little pair of sunglasses, making it darker, letting less light come in. So let's add this to the front of the camera. And we'll take the same shot again. So now F22 is available. It's, it's darkened it down. It's going to give me the correct exposure at four seconds. Absolutely beautiful. Perfect, perfect shot. Now, as your shutter speed starts to drop down to these lower, slower settings, the risk of camera shake goes up. And even with the self timer or a cable release, there's still a slight chance that when the mirror flips up, you get a little bit of movement. This, this tripod's really sturdy, so it shouldn't be a problem, but belt and braces always be on the safe side. Flick your camera into live view mode. Live view mode means the, the, uh, the mirror's already moved out the way. So when you take your picture, even on the self-timer, you still get an even sharper shot. 
However, on a four second exposure, if you've got a breezy day, things like these branches, they're moving in the scene. They're gonna come out blurred and soft. So you've gotta take that into account and that's where taking several photographs is a really good idea. Don't stick at one, do it again and again and again. Just wait until you get the perfect weather with no breeze moving anything and hopefully after a few goes, you'll nail the shot exactly. So with my, my polarizing filter on, I can now go through my shutter speeds safe in the knowledge that I can go right the way down to four seconds. And what I'm gonna end up with is a range of pictures. And I can choose the best picture, not here in the middle of this beautiful picturesque part of Wales, but I can choose the best picture back on the computer in my studio. Okay, I think I've got this position absolutely nailed. I'm gonna wander around and find a couple of other shots of this waterfall and take those too. So I've just moved a little bit closer to the waterfall and now I'm gonna zoom in and do a few close-up details as well. Don't forget to do the close-ups because they can be just as beautiful as the wide shots. The technique is exactly the same. So I've still got my polarizing filter on the front. I'm still on the lowest ISO number I can dial in. And now I'm on the half a second shutter speed. The camera will figure out the aperture. All I have to do is let it run. So uh, it's taken the first picture at half a second. I'm gonna turn on live view for the longer ones just so I get an even sharper, more stable shot. Let's do a one second exposure, which has chosen F8 as the aperture. That seems fine by me. There's really nothing about depth of field to worry about here. And again, we'll double it up two seconds. Okay, so that looks great, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip my camera on its side and do the same shots. Remember, always take the same pictures in landscape and in portrait format. You never know which is gonna be the absolute best one till you get back home. Okay, so we'll frame this up. And I can just see a little bit of water coming down there. And again, do the same thing again. Half a second shutter speed. Good place to start with waterfalls. Then I'm going to jump along, double it up. One second. Two seconds. Right, I think that's plenty of photographs here in the, well, the waterfalls of Wales. So let's jump back into my studio and have a look at processing one of the raw files. And we're going to do that right now. So I've gone through my pictures and kind of narrowed it down to three possible candidates. So let's open them from MiniBridge into Photoshop. But being raw files, of course, they open up here in Adobe Camera Raw. Now, as you can see, these three pictures are basically the same. The only thing that's actually different is the shutter speed. So this is a 15th of a second, and the water looks okay. But if I flick over to the one second image, I think the water looks much nicer. It's personal taste, but I prefer this look. The next one is the four second exposure, where I had the polarizing filter on the, the lens. And although it is slightly softer on the water, it's not enough to make a massive difference to me personally. But what it has done is it's made all the branches go a lot more blurry because they had longer to move. So simply for that reason, I'm actually gonna use the one second exposure image. So my basic processing here in RAW, always the same few steps to begin with. The first one is, does the picture need cropping? And the answer to that one is, yes, it does. These very bright patches at the top of the picture are so bright, they actually pull your eye up and away from the main center of interest, which of course is the waterfall. So let me get the crop tool and I'll try and remove as many of these as I can. I won't be able to get rid of all of them, but that's uh, pretty good. Maybe we can just lose that top one there. So we just bring that in, there we go. And I'll just hit enter and crop that down. So that's made the composition stronger straight away. Next is gonna be the color balance. And I think it could do with just a little hint more warmth. Okay, so not a huge amount, just a little bit more warmth, just to bring some, some warmer tones out of the picture. The shadows do look a little bit deep, so maybe we'll just get the shadow slider and we'll just move that up just to open up the shadows somewhat like so. 
trouble is it was quite a flat lighting and now it does look quite flat in the scene. Now I might be tempted normally to jump in with clarity and you know I love a bit of clarity but not this time that's just too strong for this scene. So let's just bring it down to about 20 just so we add a little bit of contrast and a little bit of sharpness. I will add just a little bit more contrast to the scene as well like so and I'm also going to boost the colors by increasing the vibrance and also increasing the saturation. So now it's starting to look a lot more how I wanted it to appear. But because the lighting was pretty flat, it was all under trees, I want to put a little bit more sort of dappled lighting, add my own lighting effects. And to do that, I'm going to jump over to the adjustment brush here. Now on the adjustment brush, all I'm going to do is increase my exposure about three quarters of a stop there or thereabouts and we'll make my brush size a bit bigger, or I can use the keyboard square brackets to make that bigger and smaller. And I'm just going to dab in some little areas of sunlight that just come down and hit that stone, for example, maybe some in there, and some just little areas of brightness in the picture, just like that. And then I'm going to hit the new button at the top of the adjustment brush panel, and I'll decrease the exposure by about, well, three quarters of a stop. And I'll dab in some darker areas, just some parts of the picture where maybe it was a little bit darker. So we have that kind of dappled lighting coming through. Some bits a bit brighter, some bits a bit darker, like so. And if I just flick that on and off, you'll see that just adds a little bit more lighting effects to the image. Whilst I've got the adjustment brush, we can actually do something with that really bright spot at the top, which for me is still too bright. So let's click on the new brush. We'll make a third brush. This one I'm going to bring all the way down to minus four really really dark and I'm just going to darken up that area up there that's gone a little bit too far so I'll get the eraser tool and we'll just erase what I've just done back ever so slightly like so yeah okay there we go and whilst I'm here I can also add in some color to that area because it was basically gray because there was no detail recorded so we'll just put some some applicable colors in there something that looks kind of fitting to the scene and that just helps to darken that area up and remove it from being so bright and distracting. Okay, we're nearly done, so let's just jump back into the, the normal tabs here, and I'm gonna jump over to the lens corrections, because if I really zoom in, you'll see there is some chromatic aberration there. You can see that green strip on the top of the rock. So if I jump into the color tab, remove chromatic aberration, and that will just go. And then finally, I'm just gonna jump over to the effects, and put a tiny hint of post-crop vignetting just to add to that nice sort of darkened feel that we have our own little little lit dell in the middle of the Welsh woods there. It's beautiful. Okay, so I'm happy with that. I'm going to open up the image and we'll jump back into Photoshop. Last thing I'm going to do is just apply a little bit of softness to the picture because I do like a little bit of soft feeling on these pictures. It's my personal taste after all. So let me go up to layer and we'll choose to duplicate the layer and hit OK. And then we'll go to filter and blur. And of course we'll Gaussian blur it up. And let's go for fairly heavy blur, about 20 pixels. Hit OK. And then I'm just going to drop the opacity down for that layer. Remember we put it on its own layer and I can bring it down to around about 30, 40, and that just gives a little bit more contrast, but also just that nice ethereal glow, which just works beautifully with this scene. Now, that's how I photograph waterfalls, but there are many different ways you can photograph waterfalls. And if you go to the Adorama Learning Center, you'll discover there are extra techniques from other photographers, which will teach you even more ways to get fantastic waterfall images. Well, I've had a wonderful time here in Wales photographing the waterfalls. Now, if you want to see more videos from myself and some other amazing presenters here on Adorama TV, then you know what you've got to do. You've got to click on the subscribe button. I'm Gavin Hoey. Thanks for watching. Do you want great looking prints at low cost? Be sure to visit our easy to use online printing service. Adorama Pix has professionals who treat your images with the utmost care that you can count on. For a quick turnaround on photos, cards, or albums, use adoramapix.com.